This is the Hiking Through Life podcast. We've all been gifted a journey called life. Let's see where the journey leads us today. Welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast, where we talk with people who in some way, shape, or form have been influenced by the outdoors. I'm Andy, the producer of this podcast, and my lovely wife, Sarah, will be your host. Together, we make up Hiking Through Life. This podcast is all about bringing all kinds of people who are inspired by the outdoors and sharing their stories. We hope that by sharing people's stories, it inspires others to get out and live a more meaningful life. Tune in every week for new episodes, or better yet, subscribe to the Hiking Through Life podcast on your favorite podcast provider. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with others. Also, if you have a story to share or know of anyone who might be interested in being a guest on this podcast, head on over to hikingthroughlife.net slash podcast and get in touch with us. Now sit back and enjoy this week's episode. Welcome to the Hiking Through Life podcast. Today, we're joined by Pilar Gerasimo, who is the founding editor of the Experience Life magazine, the co-host of a top-rated living experiment podcast, and most recently, she wrote a book called The Healthy Deviant that I'm a huge fan of and in the middle of reading. So thank you for joining us, Pilar. Thank you so much for having me, Sarah. I kind of just want to start this off with um, a part of your book where you are talking about the most natural state. So I'm just going to read this and let our listeners sink it in. Here's what Pilar wrote. My earliest memories are of regarding the world around me with pleasure and fascination. The most vivid of those memories is a particular day when I was swinging in a tire swing that was tied to a high branch of a tree in our yard. I was probably about two. I remember I was wearing little red shoes and looking out over them as I swung, seeing the bright red leather pass over the green of the grass, the blue of the sky, and then the white of the clouds. I was at peace in myself in that moment, content with my relationship to the world. This is as close as I can recall to being in what I now call my natural state. I think this is so significant to our world and especially our world right now with this crazy pandemic of the coronavirus going around. So, Pilar, why don't we just kind of talk about what this natural state means, what your and how this all came about for you? <laughs> well, thank you so much for sharing that. It's uh, it's really interesting to me how different sections of the book are uh, related to by different people. And it's no surprise to me, given your relationship with nature, how you would respond to that passage and find meaning in it and special meaning maybe in this time. I think one thing I'm noticing um, in terms of our current context of dealing with a pandemic is that a lot of folks don't really know how to return to the central centered part of themselves, that we are all in reaction to the news and reaction to our fear and reaction to the disruption of our normal daily lives. And um, I think it's really always a healing thing to connect back to the body and the, the, the most peaceful part of our mind, which is truly okay with how things are, doesn't question and judge everything, just sort of is and is content in that moment. And I do believe that is our natural default state. I think we come into the world that way as children, and it's not until we run up against our conventional society that we lose that sense of things just being the way they are and that being okay, you know? So right now, I think a lot of us are, you know, with our disrupted lives and schedules, one thing that's happening is many of us are being forced to slow down. We're being forced to cocoon and self-quarantine, to curtail our normal activity, to settle into a new rhythm of life. And, and there's some benefits to that. I think truly for many of us, well, I won't go so far as to say that I think COVID-19 is a gift to anyone right now or feels that way, at least. 
I do think that we can find some gifts in this shifting reality. Our day-to-day -day uncertainty is in some ways encouraging us to reconnect with what is certain and to reconnect with what does center us. So one section of this book is dedicated to exploring your own healthy deviant hero's journey. And to me, that really means looking back at your life and identifying where did you lose track of that natural state? And at what point did you become in reaction to uh, you know, people's ideas of what you should be or do and start complying with our mass culture and all of its craziness. Some of the craziness is part of what produced the circumstances that has given rise to our, our current condition. Um, and we'll talk more about that when we get there. But I will just say in terms of how I got to thinking about this topic of healthy deviance has a lot to do with my own journey and realizing that as I became more compliant with our conventional society, I lost track of my natural state. And I really just over the course of the half century of my life, I've spent a lot of it trying to refine, relocate that part of myself. And I hope all of us get more of a chance to reconnect with it now under what might be very trying circumstances because that connection I think really enhances our vitality and resilience and sense of purpose and brings sanity in the context of what can sometimes feel like a pretty crazy world. Yeah, absolutely. And I think people's natural states, especially now, is going to become so relevant because we've we've just lost that. People are always on the go, on the go, on the go. And now we are being forced to stay in our homes. But I know that my natural state for being a huge outdoor lover is I just love getting outside. I am, especially right now, making myself get outside two to three times a day just because going on a walk is pretty much the only thing that the government is telling us to do right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I think that's a really, I am too, by the way, I'm taking, I typically take between three and four walks a day with my dog, in part because my dog demands it, and in part because I need it. Um, but now more than ever, I'm really appreciating the healing qualities, uh, physically and mentally, of being outside and in nature. And there's so much good research that I'm sure you've shared out on this podcast uh, in other ways that really support how much that helps our immunity, our vitality, our resilience, our mood, um, helps regulate our, our circadian and ultradian rhythms, which are really important to immunity and regulating our, our the rest of our healthy system. But I will say it's interesting, as people are cocooning, I think some people are forgetting that they can go outside. I think, you know, particularly in less crowded situations, getting out into nature, the air out there is so much better than the air that's indoors. You know, it's so much safer, truly, to be outdoors in a natural setting, uh, getting some fresh air and sunshine than it is to just be holed up in your house, assuming that you can get out to a safe location. Right. And I mean, you are absolutely self-isolated when you're out there. On my walks, I've barely run into people. And that's just a walk around my neighborhood. And I have like 60 close neighbors, but they're not going out on a regular basis. So it's for most people, I would say it's pretty accessible to still be getting outside at this time. And just being out there and breathing it all in is even if you're out there for 10 minutes, to me, it's just this huge refresher. Yes. And I think for anybody who does that. Yes. I, I don't know anybody that would not benefit from that. And even for folks who are not right now, uh, you know, mobile or who don't have enough physical energy, for example, to go for a walk, who just don't have that choice. Even just sitting outside, moving a chair outdoors or asking someone to move your chair for you so that you can sit for 10 or 15 minutes and just listen to the birds or the wind or the rustling of tree leaves or notice the sound of, of people or traffic moving by. There's something really um, reassuring about getting away from our the screens and the 24 hour news cycle and all of the bips and blings that social media is tossing up. There's something, I was talking about this yesterday with Dallas, my podcast partner on the Living Experiment podcast, about how fracturing this environment is, this media environment, where every two seconds there's some new piece of news update or some new person chiming in with their opinion or the thing you must know. And I absolutely know right now we do need to be informed, but getting the headlines 
you know, a, a few times a day is really enough. And being bombarded by all of those different screens and news um, alerts is not doing you any favors either, by the way, is binge watching entertainment TV, all of which kind of throws your mind and body out of whack. It messes with your, um, we know that like blue light and things are not good late at night, but even during the daytime, it's a lot for your body to process all that media. It is. And I mean, I've definitely, um, I've caught myself getting caught up in the media over the past few days too. And then I have to like stop myself and be like, no, just like put it down because it is changing on a minute to minute basis, like you said. And that for the mind is so overwhelming. But there's great articles that I just shared on my website, actually, that it's titled Playing in Nature Protects Our Children During a Pandemic. So this is helping not only adults, but children to get outdoors during a time like this right now more than ever. It's going to lower our stress levels and our anxiety levels yeah. in so many ways. Absolutely agree with that. And I think, too, for folks that, you know, I, I made this point in a piece that I'm working on right now, a longer feature article, that while our lives are disrupted, it's actually a great opportunity to instill new patterns and new habits because you're already having to throw off the old patterns and habits. What a great time to take advantage of getting your kids outside and reminding them how enjoyable that is or getting out with your partner for a walk. Look, the two of you are already exposed to each other. You can enjoy the close proximity of a hand-in-hand -hand walk and you might be like, wow, this is something we might want to do more often. We might not need a pandemic <laughs> to get outside and and talk to each other without our phones in our faces, you know, and that's another thing I think it's one thing to get outside. I noticed this just a couple of days ago. I took one walk with my dog with my phone along, which constantly beeped and blinged at me. And I found myself looking at it. Honestly, half the time I was walking, I was sort of looking at the phone and walking and tripping over my own feet. And the next time I was like, well, that sucked. And so I'm leaving my phone behind. And I don't know how many times I've had to relearn this lesson, but when I leave my phone at home, just for a 25 minute walk, during which time, you know, truly nothing is gonna happen that you can't deal with when you get home. It's a radically different experience. And I really encourage people to try that experiment of just taking a brief walk, even if it's around the block without your phone, noticing how much addiction you have to having it with you, noticing the anxiety that comes from like not being able to look at the news every 15 seconds or your social media feeds. Um, just notice how different that is and whether you wouldn't like to incorporate that more often. I love that idea because I totally get caught up doing that too when I'm on walks. Um, and for people who are worried about not bringing their phone on a walk, maybe just put it in airplane mode so it's not interrupting you. Then your phone is still with you if an emergency arises. Good point. Absolutely. Yeah, I kind of forget that a lot of people use their phones as a safety device. I live in the middle of nowhere on a farm and I have the luxury of kind of walking around and not really having to think about those things. But good point. Yes, airplane mode it is. <laughs> Yes, that's that is sometimes what I do airplane mode because I just, you know, yeah, I don't live in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, and folks who have kids don't ever want to be away from their phones in case their kids need them or there's an emergency. So yeah, absolutely. Do all of these things are you have to be taken in the context of your personal priorities and your personalized situation. But I think what's generally true is that, you know, we do need more than ever in times of stress and anxiety and uncertainty to reground our physical selves by being in contact with the earth. And just noticing the feeling of the ground underneath your feet can be really nice. I will say too, from an immunity standpoint, I'm not gonna make any cases that you're going to be protected from COVID-19 as the result of taking a walk, but we do know that our immune system is constantly responding in real time to everything we do. There's a real measurable impact on all of the inflammatory markers in our system and a lot of the immune regulators as a result of the last meal we ate, as the result of the last bout of exercise or activity we got, as a result of the how good or bad our last night's sleep was, as the result of how many you know how many drugs or alcohols in our system, and including pharmaceutical drugs, by the way. But we can forget that taking those breaks for movement is a lot of what moves our circulatory system and our lymphatic system, which is so central to our immune system. And I think really, again, now more than ever, we are getting a chance to take, I think, stock of how much value there is in our innate vitality, our innate immune system. And we are really no more 
resilient or vital than that system is. And when things like this happen, uh, you know, highly contagious diseases that can be potentially life threatening, your base level of vitality and resilience and immunity really matters more than at almost any other time. But those baseline levels of vitality and resilience and immunity are built as the result of your daily practices and choices and attitudes and behaviors. And you can change those starting today. Even if you haven't been particularly healthy or observing all of these daily practices, no better time than the present to begin. And it really can make a difference starting today. Um, this is another thing, you know, I've been wanting to share with more people is that right now the news cycle is focused understandably on acute prevention strategies like social distancing and sanitizing and hand washing and which is fine. And also thinking about acute treatments like vaccines and, you know, cures for this thing. But I don't want it to get lost in all of that pandemic, you know, hoopla of the moment that right now the people who are dealing with compromised immunity and who are dealing with chronic conditions are at a greater risk of having a serious outcome, a not good outcome from this disease, including, you know, being hospitalized or having to be put on a ventilator or potentially dying. And chronic disease, the diagnosis doesn't, that's not a binary state, you know, you're not completely healthy until you have a chronic disease and then you're sick. We are all on a spectrum, a kind of continuum of incremental health improvement or health reduction. And for any given person, the changes that you make now this week could have a pretty significant, you know, impact on your level of health and vitality just a few days or a week from now or even tomorrow. And I think it's disempowering when we categorize people as chronically ill or say immunocompromised, not remembering that each and every one of us moves on a spectrum of illness and health every single day with every single choice we make. So, you know, folks who have been diagnosed with type two diabetes or heart disease or who are dealing with even, um, you know, autoimmune disorders or cancer, there are still things that you can do that improve your general health and vitality that, you know, A, I think generally do improve your immunity overall, but even if they can't prevent you from contracting a particular contagious disease, will improve your resilience to it and your chances of recovery as well as your rate of recovery and just how much you're having to suffer. Um, you know, we've heard from a lot of folks who have been diagnosed with COVID-19 who seem to be doing okay and who recover without really high, high costs to themselves or others, uh, re recover rapidly in many cases. Um, and, you know, I'm not promising that you can turn a chronic disease state around in a day or two, but man, why not do the things you can do to improve your own resilience right now? It feels good to these small steps like getting outside for a walk or having some fresh water, getting to bed a little earlier, you know, eating some nutrient dense whole foods. And by the way, avoiding the things that you can avoid that put unavoidable. So you can put a strain on your immune system you don't need to put on it. You know, like processed flours and sugars are drinking too much, um, getting not enough sleep, being in a very high stress emotional state. Those put drains on your immune system that you can, you can avoid. And right now, it would be a good time to relieve your immune system of unnecessary burdens. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And I think it's funny that you say that because it's like great for your immune system, but also things to avoid in our own environments, like watching TV so often. It's just so interesting that now all of these Netflix and places are giving all these deals or just like giving out, we saw one, I forget the name of it, but they're giving a totally a free subscription right now <laughs> to their, to their whole library of movies. And I mean, that's only feeding people's brains more. No, it's really true. It's kind of weird. It's like, you know, remember, I don't know if they'd still do this, but it used to be like you'd go to the dentist and they'd give your kid candy. You go to the hospital and somebody brings you chocolates. It's sort of like the worst thing is the thing that we do. And it's true right now, a lot of the coping strategies from binge watching TV to eating so-called comfort food, which is mostly junk food, to people, you know, self-anesthetizing or self-soothing with drugs and alcohol. and um, a lot of those behaviors or like binge watching the news with this notion that they're going to be more informed and thus safer, you know, these things are counterproductive in, if you go overboard with them. Now, I think 
look, there's nothing wrong. If you're stuck home, like let's watch a movie is a great thing. Let's sit down and watch 12 hours of movies back to back without moving in between and drinking water and noticing that it's past midnight. That's not a good idea. And you're not doing yourself or your family and friends any favors by encouraging more out of whack behavior in response to the current conditions of this pandemic. So it's worth tracking. And a lot of the reason I wrote this book, The Healthy Deviant, was to encourage people to notice how they're being socially programmed to do certain things and how those conventional choices and behaviors and patterns are working against our individual health as well as our collective health. I, I talk a lot about what I call the unhealthy default reality, for example, which is just my word for our society, the way that we're living right now, that all of the choices that are easy Easy, convenient, socially promoted, often economically incentivized choices or heavily advertised choices tend to be unhealthy choices. And the not so easy, expensive, inaccessible, unpopular, unconventional choices are the healthy ones. So we often put people in the position of having to go against social norms in order to do the things that are in their own best interest. And that's what's created some of the circumstances I believe have put us at greater risk for this current pandemic and most contagious diseases, um, as well as chronic ones, in ways that we don't need to. Now, I'll explain what I mean, because right now, again, we're focused on the contagion of the moment. But you've probably heard, Sarah, and I know many people have heard you know, doctors, physicians, medical experts saying, you know, one thing you might do to reduce your risks of seriously suffering from this disease or dying from it is quitting smoking right now. And they're saying, you know, because this affects the lungs, it's the upper respiratory tract and lower, um, having, you know, fragile or it's sick, diseased lungs is not good. Like you don't want that. But we have to remember, it's not just smoking and vaping. It's all of the things that we do that deplete our vitality and immunity. And in the same way, having a really bad diet, a, a junk food, sugar driven, soda pop driven kind of diet, that is bad for you and your whole system and, and being chronically stressed out. All of that contributes to the burden that your body carries. And right now, when they say people with chronic illnesses are more likely to suffer severe negative outcomes as the result of contracting this disease, no one's quite willing to say the extent to which it increases your chances of contracting it and being symptomatic. But it's clear right now that category of our population, the chronically ill, the immunocompromised, the, the for physically fragile, that's not the minority in our population. That is the majority of our population. Statistically right now, six out of 10 US adults is suffering from a chronic disease or condition. And you know, seven out of 10 are taking prescription drugs. Eight out of 10 are emotionally and mentally not thriving. 97.3% of US adults are not practicing even the four most basic health behaviors that would help them get and stay healthy for the long haul, which in my mind that means- That just blew my mind when you- <laughs> 97%. Yeah, 97.3. That means 3% of people. Yeah. That blows my mind. It's crazy. And I made, you know, in my book, and I think you might have been at one of the presentations I gave where I showed these charts on screen. And there's like a collective gasp when I show the chart that shows only, you know, two and a half people out of 100 who are currently practicing, again, even basic healthy behaviors. Now, what they're talking about there are not terribly high standards. And I want to point out that in the research that was reported in the Mayo Clinic proceedings, um, and all of this research is available through uh, links on my website, um, but what they noted, they, they looked at four habits. One, having a reasonably balanced diet. The standard for which was the USDA nutrition guidelines, which I think are a very low and not very good standard overall, but okay, let's take that. The others were having a moderate amount of exercise on a daily basis. They were looking at 30 minutes a day, five days a week. That's it. The others were not smoking, makes a lot of sense. And then the fourth one was maintaining a healthy body composition, meaning lean to fat muscle tissue. And, and that's a standard I think you and I can both agree that is really more the outcome of other lifestyle habits. It's not a habit <laughs> necessarily to maintain a healthy body composition, but it comes from having healthy habits um, and attitudes. But those are the four things that they counted. And Sarah, the things that they didn't count are things which are so important, potentially more important than the things that they did count, including getting enough sleep, managing stress, and maintaining healthy social connections. 
And every piece of research that I've been able to look at that considers those factors, many of them report out that those factors can individually be more important than some of the factors they consider. The question, for example, of getting enough sleep versus not smoking, a lot of experts will say, look, if you don't sleep, you will make yourself very ill in the matter of a week or two. In fact, a few days, you have measurable, significant reductions in your immunity, for example. So I asked this question of people to think about like, okay, listen, if less than 3% of US adults are managing to do the four basic behaviors that were counted in this research, reasonably healthy diet, moderate exercise, not smoking, healthy body composition, how many people would you guess are doing all four of those things, also getting enough sleep, also managing their stress adequately and maintaining healthy social connections? Uh, maybe one percent. Do you think maybe one out of a hundred is doing that? Like, and here's the thing: I really want to drive home to people. This is not individuals' fault that we can't do those things. Is not the result of 97, say, to 99 percent of the population being lazy or stupid or not having enough willpower. The reason this many people are suffering and struggling is that we have created a society that has set them up to be struggling and suffering. And until we shift the societal norms that are making that the, the easy, convenient, natural, preferred set of things to do and affordable, accessible things to do, we will be setting our entire society up for increased fragility and vulnerability to chronic diseases for sure, but also infectious diseases like COVID-19, which have a, a, a prevailing, um, predominantly damaging effect on the weak and sick and uh, vulnerable, which, like I said, basically at this point might as well just be all of us. <laughs> you know, we're on a spectrum, <laughs> uh, but most people are not in a great position right now to fight this disease off as well as they could be if they were optimally healthy and happy. Right, which is why we're all self-isolating. <laughs> yes. But yeah, I mean, it's just what society has kind of set up for us as our norm at this point. People go to the store and like you said, the cheapest things they can get are the most unhealthy things right now. Yeah. And the only places open right now are fast food restaurants that you can only do takeout or delivery. I mean, right. people don't have a whole lot of access to healthy eating right now. They could go to the store, but you're still risking yourself when you go out there because all these other people are also out there. It's so funny, too, at the market right now, I've had a lot of friends note that the, you know, obviously for good reasons, understandably, the preserved foods and the boxed foods, the canned foods, the jarred foods, the processed foods are picked bare. But there's a ton of produce available <laughs> at the market. And people are, you know, either afraid that it's infected, although much, most produce you can cook and disinfect by various means, or they're just like, I can't take it on right now. They can't take on the idea of cooking, planning a meal and cooking it, even though we might have more time available and more access to being home with our kitchens. I will say something that really blew me away a few years ago, a statistic that I learned that really helped me understand why more people don't cook at home is that in the vast majority of people do not have even the most basic equipment or setup or skills in their house to be able to cook a meal from scratch, to take a collection of whole foods, say, you know, some broccoli or cauliflower, a whole protein, a piece of animal protein or vegetable protein, grains, even beans, even anything. We just don't know how to cook because we have now gone at least one, if not two generations living in households where no one in particular cooked meals on a regular basis. We might not have knives and cutting boards. We might not have pots and pans. We might not have even the most basic condiments that would make this food taste good. And so we're really having to relearn fundamental skills for nourishing ourselves. And again, I think there is some opportunity with people stuck at home right now. When, I think one great way to spend time, if you've got it, is learning how to cook. And thank goodness for the internet, because there's a whole lot of videos out there showing you how to cook basic foodstuffs. My partner, Alan, just did a really funny little video. I think I posted on my Instagram um, story at some point about how to cook a head of cabbage in chunks and just basically boil cabbage, but add like some lovely sauce to make it taste great. And it's very satisfying. It's like healthy comfort food, but no one really knows you can even eat cabbage that way anymore. It used to be one of the most common dishes made by our grandparents and we just forgot about it. So I think we're gonna rediscover some basic skills uh, and I hope that people will rediscover cooking at home as, the, as a, a, a skill and an art and a self-nurturing strategy that can last the rest of your life and also help reteach your children how to cook. 
Yeah, and I hope that's totally what this whole thing is doing for people too. I mean, I think people like you and I who have such this positive outlook on it do see the good that's going to be coming out of this. That, yeah, the right now our social networks are our main source that are connecting us. We can easily go on YouTube. We can easily FaceTime people and get connected. We can watch how to cook a cabbage. I was watching how to cook um, a whole chicken on my Instapot. There's so many things that are just right at our fingertips right now. And we all have the time for it. And I just, like, like in your book and in your presentation, you were talking about how you were raised so healthy, you were raised on this farm, but then when we went to school, you were so healthy and your peers thought you were weird for being healthy because they were eating <laughs> yeah. all this processed food. <laughs> yeah. Yes, and that's part of you know what I call this healthy deviant hero's journey. I think most of us have this shared experience, even though the specifics might be different, of coming into the world as an infant. You know, you come out, we come out of our mother's bodies, if we're fortunate, mostly healthy, um, barring a congenital disorder or some birth trauma or something. And for the first several months or years of our life, we're just kind of tootling around, you know, we, if we're lucky, we're breastfed. If we're lucky, we have a relatively healthy environment to live in. And for many of us, it's not until we start getting exposed to our, the culture around us, the mass culture, and this might be exposed to television and mass media and noticing what so-called normal people do on TV, but for many of us, it's when we go to school or start hanging out, you know, even in daycares, where we are prescribed and programmed in certain ways to accept some things as normal and desirable and to find other things unusual or weird. And the experience that I had, <laughs> I shared with you uh, at the presentation I talk about in my book, yeah, is of growing up on a farm where my mother and her best friend started an intentional community in 1970s. It was like the back to the land movement. And they had both grown up on farms themselves and really wanted to raise their kids in this healthy, natural, outdoor world um, away from the uh, materialistic values of the culture and, you know, teaching us basic skills. And so we grew our own food. We made a lot of our own clothes. We built our own houses. We sort of roughed it, you know, kind of carved a living out of the land. And um, we didn't have a television. For a while, we didn't even have running water. I mean, we were really back to landing in an intense way. And part of that was... I mean, was, you were basically you were basically camping. <laughs> yes, basically, <laughs> for a big chunk of time. Yeah, I mean, but we because we didn't have a television and we didn't have access to junk food, we lived a, what I would say now is a very healthy day-to-day -day life. If, you know, we'd get up in the morning and we'd play outside until we were hungry and then we'd eat food that someone had grown and made for us by hand. And we ate until we were full and there, that was it. You know, there was food was good, but it wasn't addictive because it wasn't processed food. And really, you know, I've heard a lot of people say that 100% of disordered binge eating is with processed foods that people typically do not binge eat or go crazy or lose control with whole foods when they're eating. They just eat until they're hungry and they're done. And that was certainly the case for me. But yeah, when I went to school at a little schoolhouse just a couple miles down the road in my rural community, it was this was in the now early 70s and this was where the beginning of fast food and processed food convenience food packaged foods became popular and became heavily heavily advertised prior to that you know in the 1960s there just weren't anywhere near as many there weren't as many brands there weren't as many product options and they weren't heavily advertised so aside from you know some saltine crackers or something mostly people were dealing with whole foods but in this season of life for me as a young child going to school Everyone had white bread, everyone had bologna, everyone had single sliced craft cheese slices in their sandwich. They had Twinkies for dessert. They had cans of Coke and, um, you know, I don't know what it was, Tab, <laughs> probably Diet Coke even back then, <laughs> Diet Sodas. And when we came to school with our healthy lunches of, you know, my mom's stone ground homemade breads and, you know, leftovers, and they were wrapped in newspaper or recycled bags. We just, people looked at us weird. We were wearing, you know, hand-me-down clothes. We talked different because a lot of our education had happened around adults and in the home. So we spoke of different kind of a proper English than a lot of my rural classmates did. And people just thought we were weird. They thought we were freaks and, you know, communist, hippie, nudist. And we got called names. Um, and people really ostracized us. And, you know, I don't think it takes most kids very long when they go to school to figure out what the cool kids are doing, you know, what, what trends are in, what trends are out. 
And unfortunately, the trends of our society, this was true for me from grade school well through college, were toward mostly unhealthy things. And the, the healthy things that I might have thought were fine when I was young, I ran screaming from because I did not want to be called a freak. I didn't want to be seen as abnormal. I wanted to fit in like we all want to fit in because we are basically herding animals. You know, human beings want are genetically programmed to be in groups with each other and we need each other. We know we need each other to survive. So when you start thinking about deviating from social norms, you're up against some serious pressure. And we all find out that the hard way. Unfortunately, what happens to most of us is what happened to me, which is the more normal I was, the better I got at fitting in, the less healthy and happy I became. And that really took me down to a breaking point in my late 20s, early 30s that I write about in the book where I started breaking myself down physically and mentally and emotionally, eventually ended up physically breaking myself. Quite literally, I broke a bone in my body, <laughs> stomping my own foot in frustration at myself. And I think and that, that was, was all well. That was while you were working for the Experience Life magazine, right? <laughs> yes. That's what's like so ironic about it. It is. And it's a little embarrassing, Sarah, to admit that. But yeah, you know, by the time I, I, and in some ways, this is the truth. Oftentimes, it is a, an abiding passion or sense of purpose, a good thing that takes us headlong into career intensity, trying to do too much, too fast in all of the ways that we're programmed to, to keep up with the Joneses, to impress other people, to prove ourselves. These are all social conventions too, standards that we try to achieve. We look around at everyone else and we think everyone else is doing better. Or everyone else might be judging us and finding us not as good. We push harder. And that pushing for me was always in me. I mean, I think I wanted to fit in and catch up and be good and impress people my whole life. But when I started the magazine, so Experience Life, I founded that magazine in partnership with Lifetime Fitness, one of the leading health and fitness club companies called the Healthy Way of Life Company now. But Lifetime um, and I started this magazine in 2001. And what was happening for me at that point was I'd started a consulting business. This was the first really big full-time consulting gig I'd done. And I wanted it to be great. I was so passionate at that time about health and well-being because I'd learned I had to I had to intervene in my own health and fitness or I was going to be really sick and unhappy. I'd figured out how to do a lot of things right. And once I figured out how to do those things, basically eating whole foods, moving more regularly, you know, doing some of the stuff that I will tell people to do now, once I had those pieces in place, I really wanted to share them with other people because they were making a difference. But I still had this one piece of the puzzle that I really had not figured out, which was my stress. Managing stress was sort of the last piece I got after I got nutrition, after I got movement and even sleep. Um, stress was the my weak spot. And I was so passionate about what I needed to do to make the magazine work. I was willing to do almost anything. Unfortunately, I was also still holding myself to all of these other standards of looking good, acting good, making money, doing all the things I had to do. And I couldn't figure out a way to manage all of the priorities required to accomplish all of those things all at the same time. And I basically drove myself and my body over the edge. And I had symptoms like rashes. I lost the eyelashes on one eye. I had back aches, stomach aches, um, joint pain, sweats crying jags, insomnia, digestive trouble. I mean, I had everything. And it wasn't until I, I stomped my foot in this hissy fit of frustration that I suddenly had the realization that I just could not keep going that way. And I really had to reassess my life and what had gotten me to this point, um, including my compliance with a culture that was making not just me sick, but making almost everybody I, I knew sick and unhappy. Um, and that was really the beginning of what became this book, The Healthy Deviant, and ultimately took the magazine, I think, in an even better track. I, a lot of what went into Experience Life was what I was learning the hard way and what the team of um, editors and art directors and creatives with me were learning the hard way. We shared our lives through the pages of that magazine, and the team that's doing it now still does it. And that's part of what I think makes the magazine so great all these years later is humanity and honesty of not just selling the image of health and fitness, but really digging into what helps us get healthier and what makes it harder and how do we overcome those challenges in, in a real world. 
Well, and like that magazine does such an amazing job of doing that. I mean, I've been getting that magazine for, for years because I am a lifetime member. Like, I think I started getting it when I was like 17. And I remember just like tearing out the last page. They have all these like really inspirational quotes with like beautiful nature photos. I don't know if they still do that. I don't I actually don't get the magazine anymore. But I just loved those inspiring quotes. And I remember hanging them on my wall at age 17. And like looking back, that's really just like been a huge foundation and has just really been a huge tool in crafting my outlook on life. Like that magazine is huge, a huge factor in my mindset. <laughs> oh, wow. I love hearing that. That's so great. You know, it's funny as you're saying that, I'm, I just had this like flashback, you know, they, like my, your life flashes before you. I just saw this beautiful parade of all of those pages. And yes, they still do that. I think it was called Last Word. It might be called Meditations now, but I, I, I think the magazine still ends that way. And I, I remember when I proposed the idea for that, and um, I think I was working in partnership with a, my editorial mentor, D Dorothy Kalins, who started Sever Magazine and Metropolitan Home Magazine, and um, she was the executive editor at Newsweek for a while. She was a wonderful influence in helping me surface ideas like that one um, that became so important to other people. I've had more, I've had other people tell me the same thing, that they tore sections out of the magazine or that certain articles, you know, really changed something fundamentally that they were doing or thinking in their lives. And there's nothing more gratifying to me that having spent, you know, 30 years basically of my life, you know, either building up to, to that professional work or doing the magazine, which, you know, I guess for 20 some years almost, I've been working on it in some way. Um, to know that that individual lives got affected or changed, our minds got shifted because of those choices, page by page, paragraph by paragraph. It makes all of that hard work feel worthwhile. And I really want folks to think about how the work that we do in the world, it's more important to touch some individual lives than it is to, to, to get any big award or to wave any flag or to make a million dollars. What matters is the impact we have on each other and the legacy that we leave through those kinds of touch points. And Sarah, the work you're doing now, this podcast, your inspiration as a teacher, you're modeling healthy behaviors for other people. Someday, someone is going, if they have, I'm sure people have already said this to you, but more people will say this to you. And you'll probably say what I'm saying to them. And that's a legacy that I think we need more of in this culture. And particularly at times like this, it's good to be reminded the, the little changes and influences we have on each other at any given time last sometimes decades or eons or generations. Well, yeah, and like people do tell me very often that I have such this positive outlook on the world. And after I started reading like your Healthy Deviant book, I'm like, well, yeah, it's just because I, I am this small percentage of humans in this world who have this mindset and live this way. Yes. And this is the thing, you know, what, what I really wanted to do with this book is take a a huge amount of thought and reflection and research that was gleaned over the course of 20 some years and compacted into a book that would help people understand a few things. The first thing, the thesis of the book, which I think is so timely right now, is that in any high stress challenge, a vital, aware, resilient person stands a much better chance of thriving and surviving and coping than a depleted, fragile, distracted one. And in the society that we're living in right now, we set people up to become fragile and distracted and vulnerable and overwhelmed. And I want them to understand, I want all of us to reclaim the, the power that we have to change the trajectory of our lives and reclaim the vitality and resilience that is our birthright, even in the face of a society that would have us do something completely different. But it takes awareness that it is not just you. It's not this is not a problem of your willpower or your lack of knowledge or you being a bad person. We have got to confront the societal influences that are setting us up for this. And a lot of the book, the first part of the book is really dedicated to helping people reframe what they may be thinking about as their their problem, my rash, my overweight problem, my depression, my anxiety. These are not your problems, these are our problems. And I think once we really recognize the pace and trajectory that we have been on as a society, 
to make people sick and unhappy and vulnerable and fragile, the more we will be inspired to take responsibility collectively and individually for shifting that, <clears throat> excuse me, for shifting that. The second part of the book, as I mentioned to you, is really about looking at your own life through this new lens. How did I get to this place? What, it, Where am I now on my Healthy Deviant Heroes journey? And how do I turn the corner toward what I call, well, first, divergence, the willingness to do it differently. Second part of that is like rebellion, where you're like, well, this is crazy. And then the third part, which is more sustainable, which I think is the rest of our lives, I hope, is Healthy Deviants. And when you find yourself like you are right now, living a healthy, deviant life and, and, and modeling it for other people, what you find is that a lot of people will go, like, how are you doing that? Because it's so hard. How are you doing that? Well, one thing is it becomes easier, little by little, bit by bit, time by time. But I think it is a lot about mindset. And we have got to stop harping on people to just change their diet and exercise and start really acknowledging the very real barriers that they're up against. And I always say, my counsel to people is cease trying the interventions that are not working for you and begin intervening at the level of the cultural problem. Notice how your distraction and depletion and overwhelm are setting you up to make unhealthy choices and begin intervening there. How can you, I, I suggest these things I call renegade rituals to help people from the very first moment they wake up reposition themselves in relationship to the unhealthy society and reclaim their personal power and awareness so that they're not being victimized by our society on a day-to-day -day basis, which is what happens otherwise. That's what has you eating donuts when you didn't intend to eat donuts. And, you know, that's what has you lying on the couch when you've been thinking you're going to go take a walk around the block. So it's really kind of a de-hypnotizing um, that the rest of the book does and giving people practices and experiments to do that can help them reclaim their power and their choice in a in a world that often robs them of it. Yeah, and I remember one of the renegade rituals you gave at the the little um, talk you had a couple months ago that I was at was just putting your, you have the example of putting your phone down in the morning. Don't go on your phone right away in the morning and do something you really love for three minutes. Yeah. Just three minutes. Like, that's such a short amount of time. So I actually started reading The Healthy Deviant in the morning right after that. I love it. Like I was just, I would eat my breakfast and read The Healthy Deviant instead of scrolling through my phone because typically I sit down and drink my smoothie and scroll through my phone. And for what? To read all this crap that's on social media? No, that's so unnecessary. So reading this book, I was just getting so much more fulfillment out of it. I and I mean, that. you gave examples like playing your guitar, lighting a candle, going for a walk, playing with your dog, really simple things yes. that people can do. Yes. Like just these super small changes. So I practice that. And I was thinking that I need to get back into doing that again. So sometimes I still do find myself scrolling through my phone in the morning. Yes. Well, and this funny, the way you just language that is so great. I find myself doing it. It's sort of like I said, you know, we've been hypnotized by this culture that we live in and we are not even aware anymore of what we're doing or why our behaviors are so automatic. And this technology is so addictive that if you don't, if look, I will tell you, honestly, if you have a cell phone, a smartphone or any kind of iPad or device, and you don't think you're addicted to it, I would love to a challenge you <laughs> to really look at what would happen if you put it in a bag for 24 hours, see how many times you go for it. Um, I think almost everyone is addicted to it, and I include myself in that. I, I, I know apps, I've had apps on my phone that tell me how many hours a day I spend staring at this device. It's frightening. And I think about that, you know, sometimes it's two or three hours a day. Ostensibly, I'm being productive because I'm doing things for my work on it. But the truth is, I don't really know how much of that time is wasted. And I, if I look back over the course of my life and ask myself how many total hours I've invested in this device rather than doing something that will actually move me forward and help me be truly like more at peace in my body and learning skills and knowledge that will help me or anyone else. I don't, I'm terrified thinking about it. And part of the, the, I love that you're doing that morning ritual. I call it the morning minutes practice. And you could, you described it perfectly, Sarah. Basically, it's just before you do anything else, take the first three minutes of your day and do something that you enjoy that is, you know, brings you into your waking state gradually and that you find pleasant. What happens is that when people do even three minutes of that, they discover the appetite that they have to do more. 
And they also, in that three minutes, sometimes make so much either forward progress, say on a book that they're reading, or so much um, have so much pleasure in just sitting and listening to the birds saying, or looking at the lit candle, or listening to a piece of music, or playing their instrument, that they're like, wow, I want more of that in my life. And we make room for it. We deprogram ourselves. And pretty soon we refine ourselves in the context of lives that are choiceful, mindful, rewarding, sustainable, healthy lives. It, but it takes a decision to reprogram yourself. It takes acknowledging that you have been hypnotized and mesmerized by this culture and that you don't even know why you're doing a lot of what you do on a regular basis. People find themselves in restaurants with a person that they love staring over the head of that person to look at a TV screen that's playing some sort of horrible daytime television that they don't they're not interested in. And you go like, why am I looking at that instead of the eyes of this human being I love? We don't even know why. But that's why often we end up eating processed foods. They're there. They're easy. They're promoted. They're on the shelf in front of our face, not at the shelf behind. So the book is really designed to help people Wherever you want to start in this book, you can. I will say that, too. I think the idea of using your morning minutes, whether you're reading chapter one through chapter 20 something, or you're like opening it and putting your finger down on a random page and just reading for three minutes, it makes a difference because it's designed to re- program you and wake you up and make you think differently. And that's really where health starts. I think in this culture, you don't have to go on a diet. You don't have to work, do a workout. The first thing you have to do is reclaim autonomy for your own thoughts and feelings and notice what the heck is going on around you most of the time, because we live in a culture that robs you of that awareness. Well, and what I love about the morning ritual thing is that it's only three minutes because I so often hear people who like say, oh, I wish I had time to read. Oh, I wish I had time to learn how to sew. Oh, I wish I had time to cook. Three minutes is all it takes. That's all you need to do to start it. There's no excuses that you don't have three minutes for yourself in the morning. That's the shortest amount of time. Even if you have kids, wake up 10 minutes before their wake up time. Yeah, or sneak into the bathroom with your candle and your book. I mean, this is something I, I do encourage people to notice is it, it, we say, you know, I don't have time. And if you can't give yourself three minutes, you know, notice the story you're telling yourself about why you can't give yourself three minutes, because I can promise you what's getting in the way and the excuses that you're surfacing, your children, your job, your workout, the busyness of a crisis moment, those are exactly the, the excuses and reasons that are getting in the way of you doing pretty much any other good thing that you might do to improve your life and yourself. And if you can pay attention to the, the story that you tell yourself, you can challenge it a little. Uh, most people I know, even kids, even parents of young children um, can sneak into the bathroom or with an infant, you know, they can wait for that, that, you know, like you said, wake up before this child wakes up or when the child wakes up, do the three minutes with the infant in your arms. Even if you have to listen to that infant cry a little for three minutes, maybe just give yourself no experiment until you can do it. Because if you can't give yourself three minutes, you've effectively are enslaved by something. You know, I don't know if it's your society or your family or your own stories, but freeing yourself for three minutes will be the beginning of freeing yourself for a lifetime. That's so, so true. Three minutes, people, three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I want to say too, Sarah, for folks who either are not readers or who don't intend to, to buy and read this book or just borrow it from someone else, there's an episode of the podcast that I do with Dallas Hartwig, The Living Experiment, which is at livingexperiment.com. There's an episode called Morning. And that episode really walks people through how to do this type of practice and why it's so valuable. They can also search on Morning Minutes and my name, Pilar. Um, and they will find articles about this that they can read and for free. I actually point people to a variety of resources that help them learn these renegade rituals um, from my website, healthydeviant.com as well. So my goal is really to make this as available as possible to everyone and anyone who is interested. I'd love for you to buy the book. And I'd love for you to read it and get it from your library and read it. Um, but if you're not a reader, don't let that be an obstacle to you learning how to do these skills for yourself. Yeah, listening to the podcast is a very accessible thing that you can do in the car. I mean, you guys' podcast is so informative and so relevant to everyday life. I love listening to it. 
Thank you so much. And I want to tell people, too, Dallas and I, for the first time in the history of our podcast, just yesterday, recorded an impromptu episode with video um, on COVID-19 and navigating this pandemic in a way that is sane and healthy and just kind of putting things into perspective. And we do have that available, um, not at our podcast site because it's not turned into a podcast episode yet, but the video of the replay of that live Facebook live video is available at our Facebook um, page. So go to Facebook and search on Living Experiment Podcast and you will find that too. Yeah, I was listening to that a little bit this morning and I was laughing because I think Dallas was talking about how too much sitting is not an, is not good for you. Your body needs movement. The fluids in your body need to move. And I'm struggling with adjusting to this whole working from home thing as a teacher. I'm used to teaching three, four, and five-year-olds. I'm used to moving <laughs> all the time. So now I'm like trying to like retrain myself to like get up and have those movement breaks during my work at home day. Yes. It's hard to do. And, you know, the second of the three renegade rituals in my book is called Ultradian Rhythm Breaks. And again, we have a whole episode on that. And if you search on it's like ultra Ultradian Rhythm Breaks, tons of stuff will come up that I've written or recorded about it. It's the idea that every hour and a half to two every two hours, we our bodies want to shift gears. They need to move. You know, if they've been active, they need to rest. If they've been stationary, they need to move. If you can get yourself just away away from your computer if you've been in front of it. Um, if you've been with people, go try to be by yourself for a while. The body re-regulates itself during those down periods, those 20 minutes of rest between those highly productive periods. And man, not only are you physically more vital and healthier, but mentally your attention is so much better and emotionally your mood is so much better. It's an extraordinarily powerful tool. Most human beings were never taught that we have these rhythms that are programmed into our bodies just like our heart rates, just like our brain waves, just like blinking our eyes, our energy goes up and down throughout the day, several times throughout the day, just like circadian rhythms every 24 hours. Ultradian rhythms happen every hour and a half to two hours. And I really, until you're familiar with what it feels like to notice when you're going into that trench, that downtime, setting a timer on your clock or uh, your phone, whatever it is, that just reminds you that an hour and a half has gone by, even if all you do is get up out of your chair, stretch your arms and legs, maybe lie down on the floor for a minute, few minutes and come back or take a walk around the block and come back, you will notice an absolutely a revolutionary shift in your life as the result of taking those breaks. Try it for one day and just see what happens or just take one break and see what happens. Because, yeah, we're not meant to sit like this for hours at a time. You know, that's not how our the evolutionary biology of that, like we all got through 2.5 million years of human history moving for most of the day. And now we're sedentary for most of the day and it is killing us. You know, we know it's not good for us. So, um, you know, for those people who are feeling like they have to work from home, Notice, could you set up a standing or moving desk for yourself? Could you set up a wobble board? Could you take a half a foam roller or something and just move your feet around while you're standing still? Think about creative ways to move your body while you're stuck at home because your body will thank you for it later. <laughs> Actually, right now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Right now. I love that idea. That totally just popped in my mind that I should bring in my giant yoga ball and use that as my chair when I'm working from home now. That's going to really help my balance yes. in my body. And I'll, yeah. Yeah, do that. That's great. That's so, yes. Yeah. So these are strategies. Again, the default is sitting. What we think of as normal is sitting at a desk. Another thing I would recommend to people is setting up an ironing board as your standing desk. If you don't have a standing desk and you can't easily formulate one by stacking boxes or something for whatever reason, I use an ironing board for all of the podcast episodes that Dallas Hartwig and I have recorded, 100 plus of them. Have, I would say out of the 100 episodes we've done, 95 of them have been done on an ironing board in some hotel room or in my own office. Um, they're nice. They're about the right height for a standing desk and they're mobile. You can move them from room to room in your house. They don't take up much room. They're very low profile. And you can adjust the height of them in many cases to make them work for you. Cheap and easy, convenient solution. Most people have an ironing board in their house or they can find one at the thrift store. Yeah, that's a super good idea. Just like be resourceful with it. I definitely don't have an ironing board. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe people of your generation no longer have ironing boards, but there'll be a run on them at the local uh, thrift shop now. 
Yeah, see if your grandma has an extra one in her attic or basement. Probably she will. <laughs> But, you know, this is actually part of the fun is that when you start to know, like all of the things in our lives, countless things like this, we do them the way we do them because that's what's been modeled for us. That's what's been shown. We eat hamburgers and buns because someone told us that hamburgers come with buns. The fact that buns are kind of terrible for us, mostly I think, you know, like it, the scheme of things, most of the processed grains and sugars that we eat as a matter of course now, we eat just because people put them in front of us and made them attractive and they're addictive for various reasons having to do with our evolutionary biology. But it is interesting to notice, why do we get a basket of bread at restaurants? And why do we have a side of unhealthy starches with almost everything? And why is candy in jars everywhere we go? And why do these, you know, fill in the blank, like whether it's how we move, how we eat, how we sleep, how we play, how we work. One by one, you can look at these things you do automatically as the result of living in what I call, again, our unhealthy default reality. And you can begin shifting that reality. And once you start doing it, like, hmm, why am I sitting at this desk? What could I do instead? You actually realize how exhilarating it is to make little incremental changes that help you feel better throughout the day. And if you don't feel like starting with your nutrition or your movement, start somewhere else. That's why these renegade rituals, I think, are so powerful, is they don't force people into diet and exercise. They really give people interventions that are in more negotiable uh, chunks and phases of their day and life. Well, yeah, and that's what I just love about the whole he healthy deviant thing. It's not you're not telling people to go on a diet. You're not telling people to exercise. You're telling people to kind of retrain their thought process. That's all it is. Yeah. Another thing I think is really important, in addition to retraining your thought process about what's out there in our society, is challenging some of the thoughts and feelings you have about yourself. Because part of living in our culture that makes being healthy so hard is that we have set people up to hold themselves to standards of fitness and beauty and appearance that are incredibly hard, unachievable, basically. They're, they're hyper-perfected ideals that virtually no one can achieve. And particularly in the context of living in the culture we're living with, it really is demoralizing to feel like you're failing until you have, you know, 8% body fat. Well, you don't need to do that to yourself. You know, I think challenging both the standards and finding camp more self-compassion for why it's become so difficult to be a healthy, happy person, that's the beginning, too, of making it doable for you to be as healthy and happy as you choose to be, whatever shape that looks like, whatever size that looks like for you. Right now, what matters, particularly in the context of the pandemic that we're dealing with right now, is how can you become Every day, just a little bit more vital, a little more resilient, build your and safeguard your immunity and your happiness and, and your attitudes. Take care of yourself in the ways that feel good and let go of the rest of that stuff that's shaming and blaming. It's That is one of the most toxic things about our culture is the stuff, the thoughts and feelings and talk we're carrying around that we're pointing at ourselves. And nobody can intervene in those but you. But I want to give you permission to, and I want to inspire you to, and I want to give you a set of tools and exercises and experiments that can help free you from the yoke of all of that crap. Because we need more healthy, happy people in this world if we're going to turn things around. And I think that this pandemic is just a great opportunity to notice how many of the patterns we are living in don't work for us at all. And how the um, priorities that we've, and standards that we've been giving ourselves aren't working for anyone. Um, so this could be the beginning of a really creative, empowering time for us as individuals and as a culture. So I say let's go for it. More healthy deviants unite. <laughs> well, yeah, and totally. And I think that we as healthy deviants can only hope that this pandemic is going to create maybe a few more healthy deviants in the world when this is all over. I hope so. I really do. I, I think that's quite possible. I had a functional medicine physician I've been um, talking with about a, a project related to chronic disease reversal, for example. And uh, she wrote me a really beautiful email today where she said, you know, she'd been um, called away from her functional medicine practice to work in the emergency uh, room, basically dealing with, you know, tests and all the things that doctors are having to deal with right now because of the influx of COVID-19 patients. Um, but she said, you know, I, I really, I'm excited to see 
the healthy deviant work you're doing take hold. And she said, I think a lot of my patients who are chronically ill, patients that I had visited as part of a group visit a few weeks back, are more motivated now than they've ever been to really take proactive control of their health and to, to begin turning their fragility and vulnerability around. They want to do what they can do to make themselves and their family and friends less vulnerable. So if there's any time for healthy deviance, I do think it's now. And I think you know a lot of doctors who are treating patients, whether in primary care or in functional medicine practices or integrative medicine practices, I'm hoping that they will find a little bit more motivation on the part of their patients. And I hope that they really embrace that and, and empower their patients to do what they can do in the service of their own health. Because that's really where health happens is in our daily lives. And we can have great practice, practitioners, great MDs and um, health advisors, but this, this is the time to begin doing the daily things that we can do only in our own lives. Um, and so, yeah, I'm hoping healthy deviance will become a, a rallying cry out of this, you know, at least for some people, and then they'll bring other people along with them. One thing I think that's so cool, Sarah, about the work that you're doing in this podcast and in your teaching and modeling it is that when other people notice that you're doing well, you're doing okay, they see a light in you, they can sense your vitality, they feel your resilience and your centeredness, they're like, how are you doing what you're doing? I want to be more like you or that person I see modeling this. And each of us, every time we make our lives a little healthier, we help the people around us feel inspired and capable and competent to do the same. And they come to us individually often to ask how are we doing it. And when someone asks you that question, you know you're finally in the position of sharing something that you've learned yourself, not just passing along advice, but really like, hey, here's what's been working for me. So thank you for helping me spread the Healthy Deviant message and for modeling it and showing up and living it your way. It's inspiring. Yeah, I mean, I am just a huge huge fan of being a healthy deviant. And I just think it just takes like people like us, like you said, just to spread that small domino effect. People just need to see our bright smiles, our positivity in the world, and it will get spread little by little, especially in a time like this. Yes, indeed. So where can people find more information about you, Pilar? Oh, sure. For folks who are interested in the concept of healthy deviance, I would send them to healthydeviant.com. And there you can find out more about the book and the concept of healthy deviance. You can also find links to things like a Are You a Healthy Deviant quiz. Um, you can find a free preview of the book, the first chunk of it. You can also find an audio version of the book's introduction, which is called Wink, Wink, Nudge, Nudge, which you'll understand once you decide to listen to it or read it if you prefer. And there's also a ton of resources that I'm making available for free there through the Learn More section. Um, so I think that's a really good starting place. Uh, as I mentioned, livingexperiment.com is the site for the Living Experiment podcast. That's also available on pretty much every major podcast platform. I suggest people subscribe if they would be interested. Um, we've got about 100 and some episodes. Some people start from the beginning and listen all the way through, which I think is great. The very first episode is called Welcome Freak. <laughs> It's basically about acknowledging that the whole idea of the living experiment is like, if you're choosing to be a healthy, happy person in our crazy mixed up world, you are choosing an unconventional path and you basically are becoming some sort of freak outlier or a healthy deviant. Um, and there's more. I have my own personal site as well, PilarGerasimo.com, and you can find me on most of the major social media platforms, including Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. Um, but right now I'm really focusing on um, connecting with folks around Healthy Deviance. And um, I really encourage people, if they're interested in checking out the book, to go to healthydeviant.com and just see if that resonates with you. You can find all the links you need to buy it there. Um, or as I bet, you can find a lot of free content too. And I know you were doing book tours, but I'm assuming those have obviously all stopped for now. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. You know, I was lucky in that my book came out in January, but I just I was just working on an email to folks today to sort of talk about book touring in the time of a pandemic, because it, it did curtail all of my 
talks and promotional activities. Um, but, you know, again, I kind of am finding the gift in that and focusing on things like creating a Healthy Deviant Adventure course where there's a 14 day Healthy Deviant Adventure program in the book. The whole fourth part of the book is about that, where day by day I walk people through the perspective shifts and exercises and experiments. And I'm finally realizing, like, you know, this is a great time for people to go through that program. And it would be a great time since I'm home to walk people through it day by day and kind of hear back from them on how the experiments are going. So I'm using this time to develop content um, that I think will be really helpful people in this new context. And I'm recording the audio version of my book, which I can only really do from home. So that's great. And seeing the gift in it. Um, but yeah, all the authors I know who are playing, including my friend and podcast partner, Dallas Hartwig, his new book, The Four Season Solution, came out like March 10th. And so his tour and promotional period has been pretty disrupted. Glennon Doyle, who just released a book called Untamed, I know had to cancel her tour and uh, many, many more. So yeah, support your local authors if you can. And just like all your other local businesses and communities, um, everyone is suffering some sort of disruption right right now. Um, and we're all looking for the silver lining in it too. Oh my gosh, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on. This has been super, super awesome. And I really think it's going to be informative to a ton of our listeners. And I hope a lot of people share this episode because being a healthy deviant is exactly what our world needs right now. Right on. Yes. The, the, the sort of tagline for healthy deviants is, you know, break the rules or break yourself. And we don't need any more people breaking themselves. So uh, get busy taking care of yourself. Everybody stay safe out there. And Sarah, thank you so much for having me on the Walking Through Life podcast. It's been really fun talking to you. Yes, thank you. I'm walking through life. Yeah. <laughs> Walking, I'm thinking walking mostly because now we've been talking about walking so much, but you know, hiking through life sounds way more adventuresome. Hiking through life, yes. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad we got Pilar on this podcast. It's kind of crazy to think back and reflect on my own life and realize that I've been a fan of Pilar's work long before I even knew it because like I said, in this interview with her, I read the Experience Life magazine starting at age 17. So this has really been a huge part of my life. That was like 13 years ago. Yeah. So I've been a healthy deviant long before she created what the healthy deviant is. Yeah. I think this interview was a really good one to have at this time in our, in our world, actually, with the pandemic that's going on with COVID-19, I think that we can all, you know, wherever we stand on this pandemic, whether we take it as something that is going to change our world, which it currently is, or whether we're just brushing it off as another illness, either way, wherever you stand on this, I think this podcast really delivered a good message as we can all just kind of take a step back now and reassess our way of living and our health. And I think that nobody's going to argue that our health is kind of the most important thing to us. And it's the perfect time to get back to our roots. And like I read the passage at the beginning of this episode with her, uh, get back to your most natural state. And the example Pilar gave was her most natural state was being on the swing hanging from the branch in her yard where she grew up. So think about that in this time. What's your most natural state? And how can you get back to that? I think there's a lot that we can reflect upon, especially when we're being forced to really slow down our lives. Well, and it's just been giving me time to do those things that I've kind of just been wanting to do. Like yesterday, I got to uncrystallize the honey and put it back into mason jars. Like those are just little things that take time that you're always like, oh, I don't have time to do this because I'm on the go, on the go, on the go. But I had time and it was really relaxing to move my honey into mason jars. So simple things like that. You can do all of that now that you're home. Yeah, so if you find yourself sitting around bored because you have to stay home from work or maybe you 
unfortunately lost your job during this whole crisis, it's a great time to reassess and just reflect upon, okay, now what can I do to move forward, better myself, better my situation? And that goes for us all, I think. And well, I think that's what Sarah and I are are doing and we will continue to do. And I think that we're kind of lucky in the sense that we've always looked at that kind of lifestyle as just a way that we live already and the fact that we do create a lot of DIY stuff and now it's just giving us time to do that. And also, I think people can use this time I think we mentioned this in the podcast, too, to start cooking at home more. I know that Andy's been door dashing, and he said the online delivery system is still skyrocketed. But what if all of those people started cooking at home a little bit more? And not to say you can't do takeout, but challenge yourself to cook at home now. Why not now? Why not? It's fairly easy. You just have to have the right ingredients and just go on to Google and Look up your favorite dish. Really, all you need is like a cutting board, a knife, a pan. Most people have that. And hopefully you could go to a store right now and pick that up. No toilet paper required. (laughs) And this was brought up in the podcast with PLR2, but I still want to remind everybody that going out on a nature walk right now is perfect. That is still extremely social isolating. And I posted this on social media a few days ago that I was doing a garbage pickup in the neighborhood. So if you need to get out of the house, if you're going a little stir crazy, bring a garbage bag with you and get outside and do a nature walk and make it a trashy nature hike. That's what we're going to do this afternoon. Yes. Yeah, we um, have some goals of just getting out there every day. I mean, we do it anyways to walk the dog. But yeah, making that extra effort to make sure while we're in this time of, you know, staying put in place that we still take advantage of the outdoors and we do that within our own neighborhood. Because yeah, I mean, when you're sitting at home and you've experienced this, Sarah, working from home now as a teacher, which is kind of difficult, but you've experienced the whole sitting in front of a computer for eight hours a day because you have to be on conference calls and stuff. Oh, totally. I'm going a little crazy doing that. That's been a huge adjustment. So take a break once in a while and just get up and get out. Go for a half hour walk during your lunch break. And I think that will help alleviate a lot of the tension and anxiety surrounding our current situation. In adults and children. Plus... If you're out walking, you won't be bored. Listen to the sounds of nature. To check out more of Pilar's work, or to access some of that content that she was discussing, head on over to pilargerasimo.com. We'll have a link to her site in the description of this episode. Also, go check out the Living Experiment podcast at livingexperiment.com. Sarah is an avid listener, and we actually listened to a lot of those episodes on our road trip this past summer, and those were very insightful and motivating. Also, if you want to check out her book, The Healthy Deviant, head on over to thehealthydeviant.com. We'll have a link to all of these sites in the description of our episode. And over at The Healthy Deviant, you can also take The Healthy Deviant quiz by clicking take this quiz in the upper portion of the page. Sarah and I took the quiz. Actually, Sarah took it first and I took it after Sarah interviewed Pilar. I learned that I am 91 out of 100. That's like kind of how the score will come out. I'm a 91, so I am, I think on her website, I don't know how it was worded, but I'm definitely a healthy deviant. (laughs) And I am, Uh, I'm doing well, but could improve, and I don't know, those aren't the exact words from the site either, but, um, my score was a 68 out of 100, so I'm doing some good stuff, but can definitely improve, and I knew that going into the quiz. After listening to 
the interview that Sarah had with Pilar, it kind of, um, I guess, illuminated some things that I could be doing better um, to pursue, I guess, a, a healthier lifestyle or healthier mode of thinking as well. And with my score of 91, I wasn't shocked that I was a 91. I knew going into it, I was going to be pretty high up on that based on my lifestyle choices and the way I'm living and just being very deliberate in all of my daily life choices and knowing that I am a huge um, reach out person for friends and family trying to be more active and healthy. So I was proud that I had that score and I'm happy to be a healthy deviant. So we challenge you to go take that quiz and let us know what your score was. Yeah, you can actually go over to anchor.fm and either search Hiking Through Life or we'll have a link to our podcast on Anchor's site in the description of this episode. There is a message feature there. You can leave us an audio message of your score and what your thoughts are. And then we'll feature it in a future podcast. And if you don't have access to that site, or if you don't want to go to over to Anchor and want to send us a recording, just record yourself and send us the file at hikingthroughlife at gmail.com, and we will feature that in an episode. We look forward to hearing from you. And with that, thanks for listening. We love sharing these stories with you through the Hiking Through Life podcast, and we're so grateful that you listen to this podcast. If you'd like to support the Hiking Through Life podcast further, we have these amazing new t-shirts and water bottles. The t-shirts come in four colors, and the water bottles are perfect for trails, adventuring, or daily use. Consider checking them out at hikingthroughlife.net slash shop. Use the code podcast and receive 10% off your first order. You've been listening to the Hiking Through Life podcast. Peace, love, and hike through life.